Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dine Prakash. I'm a programmer curator at Maisel's Documentary Center, a 51-seat cinema and education center in Harlem. Uh, clearly, we're not there right now due to obvious circumstances, um, but I am very pleased to be hosting this um, virtual uh, panel discussion with, or rather, Q&A discussion with uh, Penny Lane. Um, a little bit about Penny, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, she's an award-winning nonfiction filmmaker who was named one of Filmmaker Magazine's 25 New Faces of Independent Film and a Chicken and Egg Breakthrough Award winner. Her most recent length feature documentary, Hail Satan, recently debuted at Sundance and was released by Magnolia Pictures last year. Her third feature length documentary, The Pain of Others, premiered at Rotterdam and went on to several other festivals. Uh, and her film Nuts, which uh, came out before that, premiered at Sundance in 2016. Her debut feature-length documentary was Our Nixon and premiered at Rotterdam uh, 2013. You can watch The Pain of Others, Nuts, and Our Nixon if you haven't already through mazels.org for free um, until Wednesday, courtesy of Penny, and uh, rent Hail Satan with half of the proceeds um, going to support the cinema. Uh, so thank you again all for tuning in and thank you Penny for being here. Thanks. We had uh, initially before uh, the pandemic talked about doing um, an in-person event to highlight a project you did um, for the film Nuts. So I'd like to start there. Yeah. Um, so that film was about uh, John Brinkley, um, a charlatan I suppose you could say, who, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, well, orchestrated a lot of elaborate uh, schemes uh, to his... It's always experience. funny for me to hear how other people try to describe <laughs> what he did. Right. It's a difficult film to describe <laughs> because there are many, many aspects to it. Mm -hmm. um, and to that end, you created a uh, guide to accompany the film called Notes on Nuts, uh, based on the idea of thinking about footnotes for documentaries. Um, would it be wrong to say that I feel like even in the field of documentary, you're someone who's especially concerned with facts. Yeah, I don't know if it's facts per se, but there, but but there's something. I okay, so I I think that my interest in documentary has always had like a very strongly epistemological component to it, right? And so thinking through like what is it that we can say we know what can I say that I know as a filmmaker and what can you say that you know as a viewer from watching a, a documentary film? And so there's always been that kind of element to it. And, you know, when I was, when I did our, when I made our Nixon, my first feature, there was like an interesting moment that happened that was very influential on me. And it had to do with, you know, that film was a collage kind of, that's the easiest way to describe it, but it's kind of a narrative collage, you know? Um, and we, there were a few, um, editing choices that we made that it would go, it would be like ridiculous to say that it would, con they were controversial, but, um, a few, a few people who didn't, who, who came to a Q and A that I did, uh, I was acknowledging some of the kind of manipulations, mainly in chronology in the film. And I said, you know, well, there's this one scene where you know, Nixon gives a speech on TV. And then right after that, we go to a conversation on the, like a taped conversation between Haldeman and Nixon talking about the media's reaction to the speech. Right. And, and I said, oh, you know, it's interesting because actually they're not talking about the speech we just showed. And then I kind of explained why we had done that. And like, so a couple of people who really um, had it out for the film, namely, I guess, Ben Stein, um, you know, picked up on that and like ran with it and then wrote this like Daily Beast op-ed that was like, R. Nixon, not even a documentary, you know, and the damning evidence was this thing that I had described myself <laughs> out loud in public. <laughs> so clearly I didn't think it was very damning, right. um, more, more like sharing some of the craft that goes into filmmaking. Right. But I thought about it and I thought, you know, how valid is Ben Stein's critique and why, why do I think it's okay that I did that? You know, it, it really was not a particular, like, in retrospect, I remember that that edit was something that I debated a long time. And it was only because like, 
if you have two things that work equally well, you would do the one that's most accurate. That's usually a rule. Um, but there were reasons why the speech that Nixon was actually talking about, like, was hard to excerpt and it didn't fit into anything else in the movie and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the speech that I wanted to put in the film was this very powerful speech that had a huge impact on culture. And so, um, so we, so my producer and I wrote a response to Ben Stein and we explained kind of like why we had done this and explained also that it wasn't like an especially damning edit, but it, but it does raise interesting questions. And that was kind of in my mind because I was already at that point well into post-production on Nuts. And to get back to your question, Nuts is about a con man. And the way that the film is constructed is that I wanted to reproduce the con kind of as much as I could. Like I, I wanted to maximize the chances that my viewer would be taken in by this charlatan, the way that he took people in, in his time instead of making it like a movie that says like, here's a con man and here are all the dumb people who fell for it, I wanted it to be like, no, we are all, we are all those dumb people who fall for it. And it's not even that hard in a way to like convince people of a lie. It just isn't that hard. So, so I already had that in my head of like, you know, sort of knowing that my movie was, was kind of lying in a very uh, non-traditional way in documentary. And I, ho I hoped transgressive way in documentary. Like I was trying to like figure something out there. But then I started to get interested in this idea of like doing what I had done with that one edit in, in R. Nixon, but somehow doing it for the whole movie, which initially I thought would be quite, quite simple. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll just make a list of uh, all the lies that are in this movie. Uh, and then I will be like, share that with the world. And then I will have done something not only moral, because I did have some trepidation about the fact that my film contains lies. I mean, it contains many, many, many mistruths and you know, purposeful manipulations, some of which were my idea, some of which were me just repeating John Brinkley, my subjects, you know, lies and manipulations. I did have some moral qualms about that. And so I, so I sort of felt like this would be a way of like somewhat solving that moral problem, but it would also be a way of like talking about documentary craft and, and making the, you know, we all talk about the ethics of documentary all the time, but I thought it would be valuable to do like a, a, a more in-depth and practical, you know, exploration of those ethical questions instead of just saying like, it's very important that we not mislead people or something, you know. And, you know, one of the things that really struck me, I was very worried about doing this. I mean, I was scared. I, I thought, based on, in some senses, like the Ben Stein response to that one edit, um, you know, that, that somehow doing this would really threaten my own credibility as a documentary filmmaker, because we are trading on a certain kind of authority and a certain perception that we are truth tellers above all else. And even though that might be valid in most cases, at least in my experience, most of the documentary filmmakers that I know are quite concerned with being accurate and truthful. Um, there are all these things we do that we just kind of don't talk about. We don't talk about with our viewers because we're afraid that if our viewers knew what we had done, somehow we'd lose that credibility. But that's an, a, a problem in a sense, right? Because you can sit there in the edit and say, or whatever on set or in an interview or whatever it is you're doing. And you can say, you know, my rule of thumb would be if my viewer knew that I was doing this, fill in the blank, you know, break in chronology or whatever, um, Frank invite some, from some interview, uh, would they, would, do I think they would lose credibility, lose faith in me as the filmmaker, as the documentary filmmaker that I am? And if the answer is no, then I wouldn't do it. But also, I don't really know because they will never know that I've done that, right? In like almost 100% of the cases. So I'm, so I'm basing this on what I think would torpedo my credibility, but I don't really know how, how viewers would respond. So, and I also was influenced by the kind of controversy around Blackfish, um, where, you know, Blackfish, for anyone who doesn't know, was, you know, a CNN Films release that was about SeaWorld, and it was very kind of um, 
inflammatory, I don't know, inflammatory is the wrong word, but like it was an a kind of an attack on SeaWorld, to put it in dumb way, dumb way. But, um, and SeaWorld's response to this was predictably to, I don't know, put their legal team on, you know, putting out this like 500 page annotation, you know, sort of saying like, here are all the lies in this movie. And when I look at that document, I don't have all the information I need to really evaluate the document. Like they're saying, this is wrong and here's why. And I don't know if they're lying, but in any case, it looks bad for the filmmakers to have this like 500 page annotated guide to all their like so-called lies. But a lot of the things in that document from the outside, at least from a cursory view, just sounded like filmmaking to me. Didn't sound like damning lies. Maybe that's a very dishonest film. I have no way of knowing. For all I know, those filmmakers are like totally full of shit and you shouldn't believe the movie. No opinion on that, but it's an interesting thing to think about that like when I looked at that document, it just sounded like they made a movie as opposed to lied, you know? Um, because our job is to manipulate. Our job is to create um, impressions. Our job is to leave things out. Like most of my job is to leave things out. Almost all of it. <laughs> just not do something, not mention something, not put something in the movie. Movies are so short. So, so anyway, it's a long way of answering your, your question, but that was kind of what, what animated the, the, the footnote project, because I had this kind of revelation one day when speaking to a friend of mine who's a historian about this issue. And I said, you know, it's funny because we're teaching at a university and like we teach our students to cite all our sources. And, you know, there's all these very intense penalties for not citing your sources or for <laughs> misrepresenting like the words of another person or whatever. And there's, a, it, for better or worse, there's a whole set of guidelines in place for say a written history paper or a written history book or something. Um, and, you know, he mentioned this uh, book by Anthony Grafton called The Footnote. And it, I read it and I was like, this is what we need. Like, we need footnotes. And I became like obsessed with the idea that, that the, the footnotes would solve all these problems somehow. Um, and that's not, it was quite a naive dream. But uh, I don't think footnotes are pointless. But if you want, we can talk more about why I think that was pretty naive. But yeah, so for a while, I thought footnotes were like going to be this thing I spent the rest of my life talking about. Um, and it could have been. But I also get bored very easily and like kind of wanted to move on to other things. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Yeah, that's super uh, thorough and I appreciate it. Um, so what you settled on was creating this online database um, yeah. that categorized the nature um, of elements that could be pers that people were likely to wonder about. So even yeah. things that weren't um, that weren't false or manipulated, uh, you pointed out that they were true. Um, yeah, did yeah. This I also wanted to give myself some credit when it was true. Right, yeah, so. <laughs> of course. Um, and so you created this, this truth scale. Can you talk about that briefly? Yeah, well, this was like the, the nightmarish element of it because I really wanted to say, that's why I said at first, I thought it'd be really simple. I'll just make a list of all the lies and then when you sit down with like pen and paper to do that, you're like, oh, oh my God, like I don't know what a lie is in this context because, you know, I, I'd had this like whole attitude about, as I mentioned before, like my attitude about kind of like the importance of being honest and truthful in your statements um, that was based on this sort of scale of true to like false, right? which is a construct that makes sense in language, makes perfect sense in language. Um, if I say something, if I say my eyes are brown, like I am lying. But if I like take a picture of myself and I Photoshop it and I give myself brown eyes, I have not lied. Like I, I have done something else that like is in a different, way of thinking and understanding the world and making claims about truth that doesn't map on to the concept of like truth and lies. And so making the footnotes was what really put me up against the wall and forced me to understand that. And so that's how I ended up with this bizarre uh, truth scale 
I think I call it truth scale, right? And it was really like, you know, um, a scale from like, you know, the, the footnotes that are co color coded green are, um, I didn't even call them true because that's like its own can of worms, but I just said they're like accurate, like pretty, pretty certain this is true. Like it's, it's, kind of like the standards you might use to fact check something. Like this is something that I that I have was claimed to have happened by credible people or you know whatever could be verified in some way. That's why I called it verified. Green was verified. And then all the way over to red, which is like I knowingly I knowingly made this up or manipulated this in a way that I would say is like actually false. And then in between, there's like, you know, um, two other categories and one is like probably true. Um, and then one is probably false, but I don't know for sure. So that's the scale of that truth claims thing. But then I also had to make a whole other set of categories that went like, um, there was one, I think, uh, I can't, even, I wish I had it in front of me, but like, there's one that's just a tricky edit, right. which would be like, that's the example I gave you before from R. Nixon. There's nothing in the film that says this conversation that these two people are having is about the speech you just saw. Like, I didn't say that, but clearly I'm creating an impression that they are connected uh, in all sorts of ways that they're not. So tricky edit became a kind of whole, and then, then I just, that became its own can of worms because then within that, you could just say the whole fucking movie is a tricky edit, like literally all of it. Like, you know, so you kind of have to just go with the most egregious examples. And some of that would be things like um, archival that's used uh, in a way that's tricky. So like if I say, if the narrator in the film says, Brinkley moved to Milford, Kansas in 1917, and on the screen, there is a photograph a black and white photograph of a small town. Obviously, I'm implying that that's Milford, Kansas in 1917, but like it, it isn't. It's just the best I could come up with to represent that image. And so the that type of stuff went into like the tricky edit category or like an edit in an interview where I'm, this person did say these words, but the way that I've ordered them is a bit not what they meant or whatever, you know. So that was kind of a whole other category too. Or like, and then I made one for like, chronological distortions so you know it's yeah these are true things that happen but they're out of order in a way that is like kind of suspicious or, or not suspicious but like just meaningfully meaning worth mentioning um you know so this is true and this is true and then omissions and that's just like again as i said before that could be everything i left everything out um but the way i thought about that was if if a reasonable person who knew all the stuff I knew, had spent all the years doing research that I had spent doing research on this topic, they might, they would notice that I'd left something important out here. So that example of that would be like, John Brinkley received a diploma from the Eclectic Medical University in Kansas City. And it's like, well, yeah, he did. But like, what I'm not mentioning is that the Eclectic Medical University of Kansas City was like a notorious diploma mill which sold medical degrees for like 50 bucks. So clearly that's an important fact that I've left out that an educated person would be like, wait a minute, that's a little, you know. So that was kind of like the whole range of things. And that's why it ended up being just like not a list, but a kind of weirdly color coded, like trying to get at the, all the different ways that my naive vision of documentary film was shattered in like the process of making this because my idea of like truth and false was fundamentally misaligned with the nature of what we're doing. And because the nature of what we're doing is we're working with images and images are, I haven't even figured out how to talk about them yet. I think images are so mysterious. I don't know what they are. I don't know what they do, but they're not they don't fit into this language construct of like truth and false. Like it's just, there's so many, it's a category error to try to make images fit into that way of thinking. And so I'm still thinking about that and I'm still trying to figure out like, because of course there's, there's language in film too. And so to the extent that you have a narrator or you have text cards or you have an inter -sub subject speaking, all of those things can be put onto a, truth versus false scale. Um, 
but then there's all the rest of it and all the rest of it is so much bigger than just the words that are in the film. To me, uh, it's such an extraordinary project uh, because I think a lot of uh, the public, you know, people who watch documentaries don't understand often the, the, the way that information is manipulated in order to convey a certain narrative. Right. Uh, and if they understand that, not only can they, you know, better get at which narratives to believe, but um, mm -hmm. they can become um, better appreciators of art, of, of film on an artistic level, I think. Yeah, the craft of it all, you know. Right. Um, and to me, it speaks in a way to your whole filmography because you're showing us um, complex, controversial characters uh, from very interesting perspectives. Um, and that kind of question what the nature of truth is, right? Um, we're seeing a very different side of, of Nixon in your first film um, through the eyes of Ehrlichman, uh, Alderman, and... Um, Chapin. Chapin, right. Uh, and then, you know, in um, Nuts, we have Brinkley and the Pain of Others, uh, which is a film compiled with YouTube clips. We have uh, people who profess to suffer from this condition called Morgellons disease, but which is not recognized by the medical community. Uh, and yet it's a very empathetic, humanizing film in which you're urging us, it feels like, to look at the truth of their suffering. Yeah. Uh, all other things aside. And of course, Hail Satan, um, we're looking at the Satanic Temple, which is a group concerned with, um, which is, well, first of all, widely misunderstood, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then also, um, they're concerned with, with fighting for their truth in a very creative way. Right, and they're doing something that challenges certain ideas about authenticity and um, sincerity, you know? Right. Because you sort of look at what they're doing and you think, well, they can't be sincere about what they're doing because they're making all these jokes and having so much fun. And you're like, well, I actually think you could be sincere <laughs> and make jokes and have fun, but yeah. Right, yeah, and actually, yeah, authentic, authenticity, authenticity um, and sincerity are great words to describe it, and I think that runs, you know, through the gamut. So yeah. maybe we can go back to the beginning, and um, you started as, uh, as like, I feel like I read something somewhere that where you were in, described yourself originally as a video artist, and, and later yeah. a documentarian. Yeah, I'm a failed video artist. <laughs> <laughs> I was just never very good at video art. I mean, so my introduction to film was so kind of random, but briefly it was, I didn't study filmmaking or art, any art making as an undergraduate. I was a kind of a media studies major. So I was engaged in like lots of critical conversations about mass media and film and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but I had a job working at a nonprofit called Children's Media Project where kids were learning how to make their own films, you know, videos. And um, I just kind of interned there and kept working there and through that started making my own videos, like, you know, kind of alongside little kids, which I always say is the only way I could have done it. I am absolutely amazed at people who can like walk into a college classroom at all of the, all of 19 years old and have the confidence to like make art and subject it to the criticism of their peers and their professor for a grade. Like I in no way could have done that at that age. It was so intimidating. Um, and also I'm, I was probably crushed by the same thing that a lot of people are crushed by, which is that I, I had very good taste and my skills were nowhere near what I knew would be good, right? Nowhere near. So there's a long period in any artistic career where what you want to do is just so far beyond your grasp. I think that would have been crushing to me. But being with like five-year-olds who were not crushed by that, who were just like, here's a video camera, like, I made an animation about my favorite doll or whatever, like stupid thing. I was like, this joy was so infectious. And I was like, I can, if they can do this, I could do this. This isn't that hard. So started doing that and then eventually found my way into a graduate school, an MFA program for, and I was tr making video art. And like this term is almost useless, but pretty much just means that I was watching work and creating work that is more connected to fine arts, the fine arts tradition, um, museums and galleries than I was watching movies. And my 
best friend in grad school would always make the joke that he was not a video artist. He would make, he would make the joke that like video art is simply bad movies. Like it's just like movies that don't work as movies in some way, which is not entirely false, but I really was trying. And I kind of just never was that good at it because I, I really just, I think I really did just want to tell stories. And whenever I tried to divorce myself from like story as like an underlying guiding concept, I would just be like, what's the point of this like formal experiment? I, I just couldn't, it didn't, it wasn't what drove me. I liked the formal experimentation, but I needed it to be connected to like a, ultimately a, a narrative. So that was kind of how I gradually found my way into doc, documentary. And then how did you, um, first get acquainted with these. So our Nixon is comprised primarily of these eight millimeter um, films uh, shot yeah. by Nixon's associates, uh, which were seized by the FBI and held in a government vault for 40 years. How did you learn about those and how did that process begin? Through a friend, um, Bill Brand, who um, it was my colleague at Hampshire College at the time, um, but also works as a film preservationist. And so he had been hired by the National Archives to preserve these Super 8 films to make uh, preservation copies. So he knew about them. He told me about them. I mean, really, he told my then husband, co-producer person, Brian, about them. And we together decided to make something from them. And we didn't really know what we would make. I mean, you know, again, Brian's from an even more avant-garde background than I was. And so initially we thought maybe we'd make some kind of like installation or we just had no clue, but we both had the instinct that Super 8 home movies by the Watergate crew would be interesting. So, so we kind of pursued that together as a, as a, as a film. Um, that's awesome. I, so we have uh, one question and everyone feel free to um, submit your own questions using the Q&A function um, or the chat. Um, somebody asked, uh, looks like we can put it on the screen. Um, could yeah. you speak a little bit about taking creative license with writing dialogue and where that falls on the truth scale? Yeah, that's great. So, um, there's only a very few films that I have written dialogue for, and they're all kind of, um, in the, in the bucket of animated reenactments. And so I guess like maybe two or three of my short films and then nuts. Um, most prominently has like a huge amount of written dialogue. Um, two things about that. One very practical, which is that I don't know how to write dialogue. And so that was actually the work of my writing partner, Tom, who is a very good writer. And I was like, I actually brought him in specifically because I was like, at the point where I realized that Nuts needed dialogue because it needed these reenactments. I was like, no, no, please no. I, I just did not think I had, I didn't have the skills or the interest in like, learning how to write a script and I still don't. Um, so all of the times this has happened in my career, it's been a partner who did the writing. But we're working from source text. So, um, you know, with Nuts, there was a voluminous amount of written, like print material supporting the story, um, but not a lot of moving images and not a lot of narrative propulsive moving images. Like we had cool stuff, but it wasn't forcing the story forward um, or character based at all. So, so Tom and I would look at these massive stacks of things like John Brinkley had written so many books or he'd hired people to write books in his name, whatever. Um, there had been all these trials and there was transcripts from all these trials available um, and tons of newspaper coverage and, and, and advertisements and stuff like that. So we, we'd always start with something written and then adapt and it was often you know, I always say like the stuff we make make up in those processes are really about like creating glue to glue together things that were actually said. And um, the other rule of thumb is that if it's funny, it's true. <laughs> like um, so much of the stuff that was said in these trials is so bizarre and so funny that we had a ton of material to work with. And um, and then when I did this short film called Just Add Water about the creator of Sea Monkeys, for whatever sort of fun reason, I decided that any dialogue that that character spoke in the film would be direct quotation. Um, and that was just a, a challenge that I thought would be interesting. And so that, that, that was something I did with that film. And then I made another short film called Nellie Bly, 
makes the news. And uh, some, and it was kind of more like not some of what she says is stuff she actually said. Some of it's stuff that I wish she could have said, like if I were to teleport this person from the 1880s to 2020 and put her in a studio and ask her questions, like what, what do I think she would have said about some of this stuff? Um, so there was tons of creative license in that film. Thanks, and thanks Evan for that question. I should note also that these short films are extraordinary in no way lesser than the features, and um, they're up on Penny's uh, Vimeo page. Um, so you should check those out as well as if you haven't. Um, and feel free to keep the questions coming. It strikes me that um, each of your uh, features has experimented with a different kind of media format. So you went primarily eight millimeter, then animation, um, then digital YouTube rips. And then, um, and then your first foray into using direct uh, live shooting stuff, stuff. <laughs> shooting stuff. <laughs> filming things, which is usually where most documentary filmmakers like start. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It took me Was like that, fifteen years to get there. Uh, in intentional uh, sort of ramping up or experimentation, or did it just so happen that those were the best ways you felt to tell those stories? It was intentional in the sense that. When I got started as a filmmaker, I mean, I think it's just true to say that I was like pretty insecure um, and quite, quite uncertain about my abilities. And I was limiting myself to the things I felt comfortable doing, which is kind of a good thing to do, uh, you know, especially when you're starting out. Like when you're, again, when you're, your reach is so far and uh, outside of your abilities it's good to put with some projects that actually make use of your abilities, you know? Um, I love editing. I knew right away when I started editing, like when I started like making videos, I could tell immediately that I was like not that interested in holding a camera. It was just never, you know, and I, I wasted a lot of time and money trying to force myself to become a camera person. Um, you know, and when you're, when you're that age and you're not, um, I wasn't aiming to make like movie movies. And so I didn't think like, oh, I'll hire a camera person. I just thought, how can I not shoot? <laughs> you know, so found footage became a very obvious thing to, to do when you love editing, but you hate shooting and you're just getting started in your career. So, so there was a little bit of like, you know, kind of creating limitations that were based on just what I thought I was good at. Uh, and then because of who I am and the way I operate in life, like each project has to be an expansion of that toolkit in a sense or else it's really boring um so i would try to like not not consciously but i can see in retrospect how i inched my way into like this next level of thing and this next level of thing or this type of filmmaking that i haven't tried before but i always i did it in a kind of cautious way and i think that's a bit why i haven't had any major failures because i've been actually pretty conservative and cautious and like my approach and i'm sort of a little bit um, adding like, so with Hail Satan, the reason that that was my first film where I just filmed stuff uh, happening and incorporated that into the film was that I knew it would be a good film with just interviews and archive. And so I figured, well, if I fail completely at like this new thing I'm trying, which is filming events in the world, then like, I bet the movie will still be good. So it was a way to try this out without going all in. I mean, it's not an observational film with no interviews and no archive and no creative reuse of found footage. Like there's tons of that in it too. So I knew that I could like fail on that one front if, it, if need be and that the whole thing wouldn't fall apart. So I think that's an interesting thing to think about like what your, if you're a filmmaker, like what your particular um, balance would be so like i have made up the number 60 40 so i want a new project to be like 40 percent stuff i've never done before <laughs> you know or that i'm very uncertain that i can do or that i've never tried or that i'm not even sure i'll like and then 60 percent of it i want to be like i feel confident in myself in my abilities i've done that kind of thing before or i just have pretty good reason to believe that i'll be good at it um, but there have been times in my life where I felt like those numbers were a little reversed and it just is about kind of where you're at in your life and like your career and your own sense of self. And so, but there, I think are probably lots of artists for whom that number is like 90, 10, right. And they really just want to be doing brand new things, uh, or like they don't want to be doing new things at all. And, and there's no wrong approach to that. It's just sort of like, 
interesting to see in retrospect that I, I feel I feel pretty consistent in that approach. Yeah, and I definitely feel it as a viewer. Uh, you certainly didn't fail in Hail Satan with that, you know, direct observational verite footage, whatever you want to call it. Uh, how could you with satanic rituals to shoot, right? Yeah, I had pretty good reason to believe it would all be okay. <laughs> uh, what was it like uh, interacting in that way with your subjects for the first time? Did that change your perspective on how you craft? Uh, oh my God, it changed so much. I mean, you know, it's one thing to say like, oh, I taught documentary for all those years and 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 sort of taught books that said that the relationship between the subject and the filmmaker is like this really ethically fraught and confusing and uh, complicated thing. And, and I knew that intellectually, but had never really experienced it. Um, most of my films were about dead people or people that I never met um, and had no relationship with. So this was new and it's still new. And I'm, I'm still thinking about it because my, uh, some of the new films I'm working on also involve all those things like gaining access and, you know, sort of figuring out like what to tell your subject what you're doing and trying to give them comfort but not make promises. And, you know, of course I care what they think about the film or like what effect the film will have in their life. But it's like this whole pile of things that I'm learning about more now than I, than I did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was very concerned with like my relationship to my viewer. And that was the ethical relationship that I was like working on and thinking about for a very long time. Um, and it set me apart a little bit because I always felt like whenever I was on these like ethics panels at documentary film festivals, everyone else was talking about their relationship to their subjects. And I was like, blah, 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 whatever over there. And now I'm sort of starting to think more about that other ethical relationship in, in a new way. And there's no, no smart thing I can say about it other than like it's super complicated. And um, with Hail Satan, there's at least one thing I wish I had done differently based on the impact that it had on a person's life. Not horrible, but if I had a time machine, yeah, I would change one scene, 10 seconds of one scene to, to make it but I think it's really hard because you can't really predict like in no way that I anticipate, I can just say what it is, so I'm not so vague, but like basically if you've seen Hail Satan, there's a scene toward the end of the film where Jex Blackmore is kicked out um, essentially. And it's because of something that she said in a, in, a, in a ritual that she was doing that we filmed. And in the ritual, in the midst of all this kind of heightened artistic poetic language, she says the words execute the president. And I mean, to me, I was there and it was so clear to me that that was not a literal call for violence, that it didn't even cross my mind that what she said was a problem. I was just really wrapped up in like the beauty and power of this ritual. Um, and then when she was, when that became an issue with leadership of the temple and she was basically excommunicated, um, I was like, oh yeah, that is an issue. I hadn't even thought of it. Like th threatening, even threatening the president might be a bad idea. Uh, I was very certain that she was in the right and the first amendment protected her and that she hadn't done anything to actually call for violence and was not a violent person, like obviously. And nobody in the temple thought that either. They just kicked her out because it looked bad basically to have a member saying things that could be construed as violent. So, I understood everyone's position and thought that was all very clear, but then the movie comes out and I'm reading with horror, like review after review or just like tweet after tweet where people are saying like, Jex Blackmore called for the assassination of Donald Trump. And I was like, whoa, 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 that's not what happened. And like, I wish I had taken 10 seconds to say very clearly that that's not what happened and that's not what she actually was calling for. So that's a bad outcome in a way. I mean, not that it like ruined her life, but I didn't mean to create a circumstance where now if you Google her name, there's some portion of the internet that's making a claim about her that's actually false, but is too easy to make based on the film I made. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. And I'm, so I'm originally uh, from the Detroit area. Oh yeah, you told me that. Yeah, and I had the great um, joy and, and pleasure and privilege of talking to Jax um, at a Hail Satan screening at Freak Film Festival. And, oh yeah, um, I forgot about that. That's so yeah. cool. She's, uh, she, and she's a very uh, serious, thoughtful and articulate artist. And you know, when you hear her speak, there's no way you could 
believe that she would just flip in. I know, which is what's so crazy because it also it's a 95 minute movie, half of which is about how brilliant and articulate and inspiring and wonderful she is. And so I was shocked by that response to her. But she had, so the, the rift between her and the Detroit chapter and the leadership of the temple happened while you were filming? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, also it, it, and it was, of course, like a more gradual process than the film lets on, you know? It's not like one dramatic event and then she was gone. Um, but as with many things in a film, like you have to compress the timeline or whatever. But so, sorry, what would you ask me though? How did that affect the... How, how did, were both parties okay then with you continuing to, to uh, work with each of them? And then how were they each satisfied with the outcome of the film? I think largely that's true to, to make a general answer to a general question that they're both sides are happy with the film. Um, do I think that both sides wish some percentage of it was different? Yeah, of course. Like there's no one in the Satanic Temple who doesn't have some opinion about like what the film could have done better or done differently. Um, and for that matter, people outside the temple have opinions about that. Everyone always has opinions about everything. So um, I'm pretty used to that. but. I would say that like, I know that um, Jex and, and Lucian particularly, because we had private screenings with each of them before the premiere, and just so they would know what's in the movie. Um, and I watched the film with Lucian and with Jex um, back to back in like December before the Sundance premiere, and they both, you know, like kind of wept uh, with with joy when they, when they watched. I mean, it was a really moving experience for both of them. And I think you know, Jex, you know, I know that it's it's harder for her with the film because of the way it goes. It's much harder for her. So I've been very, very um, impressed by the way she's handled the role of the film, having her criticisms of it, but ultimately understanding that I, like her, am an artist and ha have a point of view and that that's like, okay, you know, and even even desirable and important, you know? Right, and I, I don't mean to suggest that you necessarily have a duty to make your subjects happy with the film, but given that you seem to like them, it's probably yeah, sad. I really like them. <laughs> uh, uh, and maybe, I really like I really like them, and also like it's not a film where I'm trying. Like my subjects were like, like in my mind, like superheroes. So you know, there was a a, a desire to show them as the heroic figures that I believe them to be. And I'm certainly not going to apologize for that. That was the goal. The goal was to say, was to essentially surprise people by showing that this group was actually doing heroic work. That you could say, I don't like them or I wouldn't join or whatever, but that, you ha that I wanted people to acknowledge that the work they're doing is beneficial to all of us, regardless of what we think of them as people or as a religion. I just thought that was really moving. Um, and I, I, I loved the idea of making a film that celebrated them. And that's always was my goal. Now, if I had found out they were all frauds and, you know, really bad people, like that would have been a different film. But no, they were pretty much who they said they were, you know? And what about if your subjects are arguably, if some people would feel that they are really bad people, right? So like going back to our Nixon real quick, which you yeah. didn't... Right, so which there are interviews that were previously recorded that you used, but it, it definitely felt like you were um, not not arguing for a positive judgment of these characters, but maybe a temporary remove of judgment. Yeah, some empathy, I think that's fair. You know, some like putting yourself in their shoes. Um, and, and I think that like one thing that guides me is that if, and this is why I relate so much to the Satanists, like my general approach to the world and to discourse is that if there's 30 people in the room and 29 of them are saying, this is what we're supposed to think about something, my default position is going to go to like, well, what about the other view? What about the other side of that? And it's not because I have a bone to pick with Richard Nixon. I mean, that was all before my time. I don't really care that much about the Nixon presidency. It's like, you know, not especially important to me. Um, but in my time making the film, my, my natural place to go, my natural center of gravity is going to be a bit like subversive. It's going to be a bit like, you know, everyone I know is, thinks these people are like the worst people ever. So like maybe I could take a position that there's some other way of thinking about this. And the film's pretty gentle. Like you, you don't have to think they're good people to enjoy the film. And I know that because one time I got an award 
at Michael Moore's Film Festival, and he, like, as he was handing me the award, he was describing the movie that I made, and I was like, whoa, like, that's a take. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he was like, this movie just really gets at the banality, and da, da, da. and I was like, did you watch it? Okay, whatever, I'm gonna take the award and run away, but... So I know that it's possible to enjoy the movie, even if you think they're all like the worst people ever. Um, but of course, that my goal was not to make them the worst people ever. My goal was to, to make them people. Right. They're big criers <laughs> by their reports, which is... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they have feelings. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I want to talk about, make sure we talk about uh, the pain of others, which uh, <laughs> in the interest of not misrepresenting that, I wonder how, how you would describe that film. I think you described it really well earlier, but yeah, so basically... It's a film uh, made up entirely of the YouTube videos, you know, vlogs, which is, I cannot believe that word stuck, like, really didn't think vlog was going to be around. But so it's mostly just vlogs by three people, three women on YouTube who are part of a community of people who um, have an, uh, an illness called Morgellons. And the illness is... Um, uh, very contested. Um, you know, m most medical people, science people will tell you that there's no such thing as Morgellons or that if there is something called Morgellons, it's all in there. It's a kind of um, psychological illness, essentially. Um, but the, the, the illness purports to manifest in like very clear physical things. Like, so unlike a lot of these contested illnesses, which I was very interested in, in part because of the unresolved part of my mind from nuts, right? Because the unresolved part of nuts is basically like has to do with how you answer the question, did Brinkley's cure work? You know, and that's actually not that easy of a question to answer. I mean, you could say scientifically there's no validity to it. That's true. Uh, but did it work would be like, well, I don't know. Were, were there people who had uh, a, a psychological improvement in their in their condition after having been seen by this magical doctor with his magical cure. Like I'm, I'm sure there were people that thought it worked so that it did work for. So that was kind of in my mind and this kind of unresolved thing about like the placebo effect and all those kinds of things. And so I was very interested in things like, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome and other things that fall into that uh, chronic line, things that fall into that bucket of un uh, contested illnesses or illnesses that really call into question the sort of absurdly dualist way of thinking which is like it's either a psychological illness or it's physical which is not true at all uh, not even a helpful again a category error like not not a useful way of viewing the world but it is the way we view the world so but this one was really interesting to me because there were either like things coming out of people's skin that were physical and observable and photographable or there weren't, and so I, so I found that particular illness the most interesting of the bunch because unlike pain, which is necessarily a subjective, kind of hard to measure thing or impossible to measure thing from an external view, this was something that ostensibly would have physical evidence that you could either see or not. So uh, I did a bunch of research on it and ended up, think, I thought at first I might make this kind of complicated documentary that would have all these different parts to it. Like you might expect a documentary on this subject to have, like here are the doctors, here are the scientists, here's the, you know, um, sufferers. But I was just so captivated by the vlogs that I was watching that they became the only thing I really cared about when it came to this topic. And I didn't want to interview people. I, you know, there's a huge difference between representing the self-created testimony of a person whose sanity you question and the creation, the, art, the interviewing of that person, seeking that person out, uh, developing a relationship with them, putting them on camera is a very different ethical proposition. And I had no interest in doing that. I, 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 the, the, the exploitation factor that was present there, given what I believed about the mental state of the people that I was observing, put me, and maybe it's just, and it's just personal preference. I'm certainly not saying that no one should do that. Not at all do I think that. I mean, we all like Grey Gardens, you know? So like, I'm not saying that, it's just that I didn't want to, it wasn't something I felt comfortable doing, but watching the videos that they made, like our Nixon, was a whole other can of worms that I did feel comfortable doing. 
uh, it, get, it gets back to, again, my comfort zone. My comfort zone is more in like editing than it is in shooting. You know, I still don't really feel all that comfortable shooting. I think <laughs> pointing a camera at people is like really rude and uh, <laughs> like weird. And I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy it at all. I think it's a, a, ne a necessary discomfort in my field, but I don't think it's fun, you know? So anyway, um, that's, that's how I describe the film. So the film is like, you know, it's a feature, but it's just made up of videos that are from YouTube, 90, 95% of which are direct to camera, personal testimony talking, and a little bit of, um, you know, news clips that they shared on their own channels about Mark Ellens. Um, it's a film that to me definitely comes off as more interested in emotional experiences of, of these people than in investigating, like, is Mark Ellens real, what, you know. Right. Um, and I wonder, to what extent uh, were they, did you reach out to them um, about, did you get permission to, to create the movie using their clips and how did they respond to that? I did reach out and I didn't ask permission. It was sort of a different question. You know, I, I was doing this film and I let them know that I was doing the film and I asked them if they wanted to be involved. And I kind of like laid out a few different things that might look like. Do you want to be involved in like, you know, um, watching the cut and giving feedback? Do you want to be involved in potentially being available for press? Do you want to be involved in attending screenings? Like any number of things, you know? Um, and there were three, three, three women. Um, and so let's see, so one never responded and I reached out to her in ways that, so I knew she received my messages, right? So I was able to see on Facebook Messenger that she had read the message and I was like, okay, so she doesn't want to talk to me and that's fine. I'm not going to keep writing to her. So that was one person. And then a second person was kind of at first very excited because she thought that I was making a movie that confirmed her, her conspiracy theory that Morgellons was a, a bioweapon, you know, dropped by chemtrails and developed by the Department of Defense to like mind control people, you know, New World Order thing. And, and I, when she realized that I wasn't making a film that confirmed her con conspiracy theory, about that she lost interest and then the third one and the hardest one was someone who kind of expressed a little bit of interest and then changed her mind said that she had prayed on it and that she had kind of like a a feeling that it wouldn't be in her best interest to be involved so i didn't definitely didn't like harass them or spend a lot of time on this it was just what I felt was like basic human courtesy, you know? And the thing about the film that I think is the most, I think it's a very transgressive film. And I, and I know that, like it's not like I don't know what I made. Like many times I tried to walk away from it because it was so uncomfortable. I mean, the movie's so uncomfortable. And I felt uncomfortable making it. And I know people feel uncomfortable watching it and it's uncomfortable in like every way. And it's also like ugly. I mean, there's so many things about it that are like hard. Um, and it's not a film I could have made 10 years ago when I didn't have any self-confidence as a maker. Like I had to have like a sense of like, I know there are people who are going to think this is a bad movie and people who are going to think that I'm a bad person for having made it. And I know that's true. And I, and I know they're wrong. So it's okay. Right. That, that takes a lot of self, uh, aware confidence, I guess, um, that I, that I felt kind of amazed that I had after all these years of not feeling like I had any, but. But the, the main thing that's transgressive about it is that you watch it and you feel like you're not supposed to be watching these videos. The videos are so raw and they're so intimate. Um, and you just feel like, oh my God, like, why am I? Like, like Penny should not have put this in a movie or something, right? But the thing that's so strange about that is that my little art movie has reached a paltry percentage of the huge amount of views these videos get on YouTube, right? These are like, between the three of them, like millions and millions of views. So, and the comments on YouTube are exceptionally mean, like really mean, like you're crazy, like shut up, whatever. So I knew that my audience, my like sophisticated art film audience would be the most empathetic viewers these people were likely to find, not, not the least, you know? So, so I think there's a, there's a way that it feels like I've done something where I found these obscure people who are like, no one, no one's ever interacted with and I put them on the big screen, you know, and it's actually like weirdly the opposite, which I really enjoy because it does add to the discomfort of the movie, the sense that, that you're not supposed to be watching these videos. 
yeah, it does, made for it, public consumption and like explicitly want to be shared, you know? Right, rewatching re the, the film, it, I was, it felt very close to my Zoom group therapy sessions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, Love while that. you, uh, also if you have a, a we, we're, we're about wrapped up here, so if you have a question, you kind of get it in now. Um, but uh, at the very end of the film, you do, while engendering empathy, it feels like the entire time, you do put a little disclaimer at the end. If you believe you're suffering from Orgellans or someone you know is, please seek out evidence-based sources. So yeah, I had to. I just had to. <laughs> I had to because the movie doesn't help. I mean, the movie does not correct misinformation. Like, again, kind of like nuts. Like, I am will willfully helping to, like, spread misinformation and... I mean, what am I going to do about that? You know, I mean, I, I had I, I had to at least somewhere, like the title of the film and like the text card at the end are the only, the only real clues that I'm giving about my view on this whole subject. And um, I ha had to do that. But I also like, um, uh, I just sort of, um, I had to, the editing of the film is like, again, I think the only ethical editing I could do, which was, a very unobtrusive editing. Like it looks like I've just put a bunch of YouTube videos in a row, like as if I haven't edited them at all. And that the only editing choices I made were like, what order would I go in? And there's a few places, but it was music, um, very few. But that was on purpose too. I mean, it's actually heavily edited film because um, most of their videos were like an hour long or two hours long. And I'm creating scenes that are, they seem very long in like movie language time, but they're really only like seven minutes long or whatever. Um, so it feels like you're watching these long things. Uh, so, but, but I, I had to do that because I was not going to, I had to accurately represent their work, like their videos, their words, their point of view. I, I really wasn't interested in making a film that was like, what, what does Penny think about all these things? Like that had to be like under, like kind of receded. So I, I wanted to take a back seat. And that's again, part of what makes the film difficult. And, and uncomfortable is that you you kind of want the filmmaker to tell you like what to think about all of this and I'm just like no I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm just not going to and that's to me like the truth you know because to me the truth of it this is why to get back to the beginning of this conversation like my ideas about truth have evolved so much from the time that I started nuts where I thought it was just very simple things were true or they weren't you know and I've started to really understand that like stories contain truths. And this all sounds so wishy-washy and like too, like truthiness and too much like, you know, we live in a post-truth era, which all that's sort of stupid. And I don't believe any of that. I, I believe very much in like the value of um, accessing truth and as you said, facts and things about the world. I think it's a matter of life and death. Um, so I do think it's very important, but to disregard this whole other area of human knowledge that comes in the form of literature and stories and myths is silly. I mean, you're disregarding a huge amount of what we know about human nature. And there are things that we can know about our lives and the reality that can only be expressed in an image or in, in, in a story. And so in that film, that's what I was thinking about. I was sort of like, let's, I'm going to like put aside some of this sort of, um, truth versus false thing and I'm going to try to like enter into this experience with these people and feel what is true about it you know see it sounds so this is why I hate it because it sounds so like dumb it's like this offends me I'm a very logical person I want to be able to explain exactly what I mean by that and like I can't like I don't understand images or stories they're like very mysterious and very powerful and that makes me very suspicious of them, like suspicious of this kind of, uh, like someone's ringing my doorbell. <laughs> Everybody come over here. Um, uh, no, that's uh, very well said. And um, we are actually, uh, we're a few minutes over time. Yeah, so it's um, good, we'll leave, we'll leave it on the thing that I'm just like totally mystified yeah. by, we'll, so. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Penny. Thanks. Um, it was really fun. Yeah. And uh, if you are able, uh, kind audience members, uh, please do consider donating to Maisel's Documentary Center, which you can do through our website. Um, and uh, we'll all see you all soon. Thank you. Bye, everybody.